It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler. It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler. Hey guys, Tyler here. So for this video, we're gonna analyze the paper that is called On Having Whiteness. Like with most people who've seen the whole entire paper for the first time, I came across this article through the abstract and actually, of course, when I saw the abstract, I was like in shock on just how crazy the idea is. And so without further hesitation, let's read the paper out loud. Whiteness is a condition one first acquire and then one has. The condition is fundamental, generate characteristic ways of being in one's body, in one's mind, and in one's world. Once established, these appetites are nearly impossible to eliminate. Effective treatment consists of a combination of psychic and social historical iterations. Such iterations can reasonably be aimed to reshape whiteness and frustrated appetites to reduce their intensity to redistribute their aims and occasionally turn those aims into the work of reparation. When remembered and representative, they are basically a condition that can either work as a warning never again or a temptation great again. Memorialization alone, therefore, is no guarantee against regression. There is yet a permanent cure. Yet again, this paper is just one of many, many examples of which people try to demonize white people as parasites and whatnot. Because the last video I did, I talked about a speech in which basically a psychologist also claimed that apparently that she had dreams of shooting up white people with a revolver and so the continual dehumanization of white people is something that I guess is normal. And because it's normal, it's perfectly acceptable to just hate on somebody just because of their skin color. But uh, let's continue on with the article. And what I follow, I will capitalize whiteness to signify parasitic whiteness, an inquired multidimensional condition. One, a way of being. Two, a mode of identity. And three, a way of knowing and sorting out the objects constructing one's human around. Whiteness should not be confused with lowercase whiteness, a commonly used signifier of racial identity. I'm curious if there's such a difference between capital W whiteness and lowercase whiteness, why would you call it whiteness to begin with? Because you're saying right here in this part that there are people who are white but don't have whiteness, but the people who are white, some of them, have whiteness. It's like so strange and so bizarre. A matter of fact, I know that of course in scientific papers or resource papers, and I really hate to call this whole entire thing a research paper, but what happens is that they use different terminologies to, I guess, identify a problem. So, if it's not talking about all white people, why use the word to begin with? Because basically by using whiteness, you're just demonizing somebody just because of their skin color. Any infant is vulnerable to the parasitical whiteness. The extent of the infant's vulnerability depends on how the infant is mapped, how it's positioned, or its place. All infants orient itself in relation to a first initial mapping line. On this side of the line will live as familiars us, while on this side will live as strangers them. For every infant, this mapping line founds, delineates, and defines the place of the stranger. As such, it marks the site of the first organized and enduring representation of an internal source of anxiety. Beginning with the onset of stranger anxiety, the infant, while working the finest place in the world, will perpetually aim for safety, avoiding as best as they can any external object located on the dangerous stranger's side of the line. Parasitic whiteness works to turn this foundational line into an impatiable wall to permanently fix the place of the non-white stranger on the far side of the wall. There is to be sorted and categorized and eventually mastered. To translate all of this mumbo jumbo, what the author is trying to say is that apparently babies are like inherently born as racist 
because of things in their surroundings. And honestly, I don't think that's true. I don't think anybody is just, you know, born in the world just to hate on people. Because hatred is pretty much taught to them. So I guess if a baby was to be born in a surrounding where it's pretty much common to hate on people just because of their skin color, obviously that person might be racist and might change their mind once they have, of course, interaction with people and build friendships no matter the race. At the same time, though, I don't think that, of course, this whole entire idea, of course, like people who are born in families don't be inherently racist. And so it's so strange, it's so bizarre to even pitch that sort of concept. Parasitic whiteness generates a state of continuously exotified excitement towards frenzy. There seem to be no backward path, no moral to retreat. It faces an immediate forward march. It can only totally and permanently transform these objects, turn the once fear and unknown into the now reduced and measure, turn the once unique and overwhelming into the now formidable and own. Whiteness organized and not in Edison, but in entitlement. And God said, <clears throat> let us make man into our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominance over the fish over the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the castle, and all over the earth, and every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominance over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the, er of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. Yes, guys, you heard that correctly. He is freaking using a Bible quote and saying that the biblical God justify, of course, this whiteness, and therefore it wants it to control all over the minorities. And it's just so strange. Like, how does that Bible quote actually endorse, you know, enslavement or taking over other people? You could probably, you know, look at other verses, right? There are some verses that do, in fact, endorse slavery. But this verse right here is not like, you know, the best kind of verse, you know, to pick. But uh, that's very strange. When targeting individuals, whiteness optimistically attaches any psychic structure that maps itself an object virtually. These virtual planes are ubiquitous and such provide an abstinence of potential host reception for parasitic whiteness. Six separate yet intersecting such plans should be kept in mind here. Number one, the Eagles Foundation, a vertical split, pleasure inside, pain outside, good subject here, best object there. The original object then is the bad object, the, the mean one below and instructing of whom Freud writes, the eagle hates and pursue with the intent to destroy. 1915, page 138. Two, the object subject world of the paranoid schizophrenic position. The emergent subject here is in a constant struggle to maintain itself against the threat emerging from bad objects to withstand them and finally to fix and locate them elsewhere enough, below enough to settle and to keep going. The subject-object world of narcissism, of curiosity and diminishment of the master and the slave, of the all or nothing highest and lowest. Number four, the subject-object world of preservation of the user and the use, the person and the thing, the whole and the paint and the part, the owner and the own, the dominator and the denominated. Number five, the subject-object world of a triangle of higher and lower a power and powerless of having and not having. It's so weird and so bizarre how they talk about this whiteness wanting to control people when in fact our whole entire country has the freaking 1964 Civil Rights Act which pretty much makes such discrimination against people based upon a race as well as a constitutional amendment to ban slavery. So where is this whiteness wanting to dominate the whole entire society? because I still am looking and looking and looking, but I cannot find any results. If you say police brutality, I say that police brutality targets everybody and not just black people. If you're talking about like, you know, systemic racism, what's systemic racism? No company can actually reject you just because you're a certain race. 
And so all of this to me just seemed like word salad, just to justify their position. But of course, whiteness does not limit its opportunistic work to individuals. It easily infiltrates even groups founded on the protection of individuals, on democratic principle, on a systemic concern for fragile singularities. But when this group contacts an ominous virtual plane, when, for example, it feels jeopardized by external or internal threat, its founding horizontal principles can suddenly seem naive and dangerous. We can sense one such threat around the world now, refugees in need, demanding a place, and disrupting democratic assumptions of inclusiveness. Whiteness is always ready to respond to such a threat to answer the call. This whole entire notion of not wanting illegal immigration or refugees for a limited immigration in the country is not necessarily a white thing. Why would it be like a white thing for somebody to want limited immigration? Because sometimes, of course, if you have like no borders whatsoever, then a nation ceases to become a nation. And so any sort of, you know, country on which there's like, you know, Asian people in charge or African people in charge or whatever, they make their own rules, their own regulations when it comes down to the subject of immigrations. And some company and some countries do in fact allow Im limited immigration. And so basically it's not necessarily the fall of whiteness that those countries who happen to have mostly black people or Asian people or whatever to have such immigrants to be limited. So it is so weird, so bizarre to say that it's a white thing because it's clearly not. It's a universal principle that if you don't have some sort of limits, then people will take advantage of it. A woman in analysis is speaking of her growing disgust at her male partner. She could barely tolerate his neediness, his assistance that they always be together. Increasingly restless and sexually unsatisfied, she began to threaten either affairs or a breakup. Her partner responds forcibly and repeatedly with an image that has been persistent in her relationship. He says to her, This is not you speaking. I know you love me. It's the pink monkey you have inside you. That's what's talking. That monkey is crazy. Wild. You cannot control it. You need me to keep it under control. She began speaking about the dream hesitantly, afraid it means she's becoming crazy again, perverse and sick. I say she seems to expect me to confirm that. Isn't that what psychoanalysis do, she says. Ralph says I'm crazy, and you don't? Aren't you a cop too? She begins to laugh. If that dream isn't sick, then what is? She asks, laughing more. She explains, it's the pink monkey. That's what it does. The pink monkey is a sex monster. Every possible part. Penis, boy, woman, me. Not so bad. Really, not so bad. Really kind of cute. Don't you think so? I generally have no idea just what the fuck did I just read. I was just going on and on about a girl and some sort of crazy pink monkey. And I'm just trying to think to myself, well, what does this have to do with the topic? Well, like we're talking about, you know, how whiteness is evil and that apparently that there are some white people who possess this whiteness. And here we are just talking about a crazy girl and her delusions. I'm just trying to understand what this has to do with the topic at hand. Where to stand on what stable platform to turn whiteness into an object for a stop, one must look into the point of stillness. This point actually does not exist. After all, whiteness in its mature form generates a volatile totality in which there is no clear exit, no clear escape. To pursue that exit, to hope that even temporarily escape of getting outside and looking back, of seeing what you seem to have been, depends, I think, on a kind of conceptual morality a willingness to use metaphors and similes for only as long as they serve, and then to move on. For me here, the most important of these metaphors have been parasites, mapping, and vulnerability. So here we have it folks, a brief summary of the whole entire 70-page paper about this concept of whiteness. I'm still in awe 
that this is actually, of course, something that is being, you know, published by some sort of peer review people to publish it for science or whatever. It's just so weird and so bizarre that they clearly publish something that, you know, is reminiscent to what happened in Nazi Germany and the Jews with Mein Kampf. It's so strange that they try to openly just hate white people just because of their skin color. Again, like I said before in many videos, like imagine if they were to do the exact same thing for other minorities, but for some strange reason, it's just perfectly okay to say it against white people. So, if you guys want to see the entire video, I have the link in the description box down below. And as always, I'll see you guys next time. It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler. It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler.